Hello, welcome back to Overture Hall after your networking session to listen to an exciting topic, artificial intelligence, or as we know it, AI. In this summit session, we will explore some of the new ways companies are using AI and machine learning to revolutionize industry and improve human health. I'm Amy Kralum, the Director of Customer, Community, and Economic Development at Alliant Energy. I'm proud to introduce today's session on behalf of my organization. At Alliant Energy, we are powering what's next, and this session definitely is looking at what's next. I am excited to introduce our speakers that represent outstanding research universities in the state of Wisconsin, both the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We also have Isla Khalil from Novartis streaming in from Boston. That's technology for you. Presenting first will be Matthew Friedel, Senior Lecturer at the UW-Milwaukee School of Information Studies. Matt will also moderate our session. Next will be Tony Gitter, Associate Professor, Department of Biostatistics, Medical Informatics, and Investigator, Morgridge Institute of Research. Tony will be followed by Aya Khalil, Global Head of the AI Innovation Center at Novartis. After each person has presented, there will be a panel discussion. The panelists would like to have audience questions for them, so start thinking about those questions now. Finally, please read their full bios on the Wisconsin BioHealth Summit website or by scanning the session QR code to get more information about our presenters today. Now let's hear more about this exciting topic of AI. Matt, please start us off. Uh, well, good morning. This is fantastic. I appreciate you coming to this session. Again, my name is uh, Matthew Friedel. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. I also wear a couple other hats. Um, I'm co-founder of Milwaukee Venture Partners, which is an angel network. We help fund um, startups in the Wisconsin and Midwest region. In fact, if you go to the Young uh, Companies Forum today, you're going to see uh, Muto Scientific, which is one of the investments that I'm in and my fellow angels are in as well. Um, I also co-founded the Disruptive Technologies Lab, which is really a platform for us to do research and collaborate with industry partners around not only AI, but blockchain and IoT. And, and I'm sure all of you are aware that all of these are kind of um, coming together to form a, a lot of different research areas. So this is what I'd like to talk about today. Um, what is the current state of AI? I want to briefly talk a little bit about uh, the hype cycle. And my assumption of you guys coming in today is that you don't have any prior knowledge. We've got some really great panelists that are going to do a deep dive in some really cool research, but I'm assuming that you're coming here with no knowledge. So we're going to talk a little bit about AI, what some definitions are of that, what some definitions are of machine learning, and try and look at the hype cycle because we want to differentiate what's real and what is not. Um, and then finally, we'll go over a couple of common AI applications, and then I'll do a shameless plug for UWM and some of the cool stuff that we're doing in there. So let's do some quotes here first. This is the CEO of Google. Machine learning is a core transformative way by which we are rethinking everything we're doing. That's a pretty powerful statement, right? How about one more? Here's the CEO of Microsoft, a proud UWM alumni, by the way. Uh, artificial intelligence is the defining technology of our time. It's going to be AI at the edge. It's going to be AI in the cloud. It's going to be AI as a part of SaaS applications. AI as a part of, in fact, infrastructure. So again, two powerful uh, statements from uh, pretty big tech companies. So um, I get this question all the time when I give presentations like this and when I lecture into my uh, classroom, will robots take my job? And I want to change that question a little bit, um, or change the narrative of that, because throughout history, automation and technology has changed the type of work that we have done, right? We used to have telephone operators. We used to have bowling pin setters. Uh, we used to have ice cutters, and they were all replaced by that. So if you look at the current research that it is right now, somewhere between 40 and 50% of the jobs that we have are not going to be eliminated, but they're going to be disruptive. So in my opinion, one of the roles that I have at the university and one of the roles that I have as an angel investor is to identify 
um, you know, spaces in this so that we can educate our students for the jobs going forward because some of the jobs that we have now are not going to be around. So as long as we're astutely aware of that, I think we can make really, really educated guesses or uh, educated decisions on that. So let's take a look at some articles that business leaders take a look at. This is one Forbes article. This is one, um, let's see what, a Wall Street Journal. Every company wants to become a tech company, even it kills them. On your marks, the business leaders are preparing for an arms race in artificial intelligence. So if I was CEO or CTO, I'd be, be concerned. But what we can do is we can look at, Garner creates what is called the technology hype cycle. They do this for every year. This is going back a couple of years. And they map out where the technology is. And they don't just do AI. They do blockchain and a lot of different items. But some of the uh, um, common applications that you probably use on a daily basis are listed on here. So fully autonomous vehicles, in my opinion, beyond regulation, are, are way far out. I and mean, we have pockets of those, but it's not like we have autonomous vehicles going around uh, currently right now. Voice assistants. I use Surrey almost on a daily basis. I use um, Alexa on a daily basis. Amazon has 10,000 people working on Alexa. So these are some of the areas that you're going to have, and my fellow panelists are going to talk about it. We're going to have real breakthroughs. We're going to have real applications. We're going to have uh, real products and services that are going to come out of it. So part of uh, the research that I do is identifying what some of these uh, uh, perspective patterns are. So what I think is very interesting right now is, uh, this is going back from a couple of years, is that we're very close uh, the, to the peak in FinDeck uh, with more than 10,000 startups jumping onto that uh, boom. And what I would say is this time right now is almost analogous to um, the birth of the web or the birth of mobile and social media. And what I mean by that is we're going to have companies that are going to be created on the AI front and we're going to have some pets.com and we're going to have some Amazon.com, but we're not going to have 10,000 fintech companies in five years. Okay, we're going to have a much smaller footprint. But some of those are going to use AI very effectively, and they are going to provide unique products and services uh, for us and earn a significant profit off of that. So I think it's a very exciting time right now for artificial intelligence. Um, so let's do a, a definition. Here's a couple one. Um, AI is a simulation of human intelligence processed by machines, especially computers. Uh, the process includes learning and reasoning. Okay, this is going to be different than us creating a program that has a conditional expression, like if A happens, we do B. If C happens, we do D. Nope, that's not the case. Okay, it's a program that can sense, reason, act, and adapt. That's a distinctive feature right there. All right, so we're feeding it data. We're feeding it experiences. We're feeding it information, and it's learning off of that. Uh, furthermore, we could actually have some characteristics that are connected with it. So how about autonomy? Obviously, we are familiar with you know, autonomous vehicles and what Tesla is doing in the space. The uh, ability to perform a task in a complex environment without constant guidance by a user, right? That's literally the definition of an autonomous vehicle. What about adaptability? So here's the ability to improve performance by learning through experiences. Again, we are not programming these applications. We're feeding them information. We're feeding them pictures of dogs. We're feeding them pictures of cats. And our algorithm can then identify between those two um, uh, the animal types. So that is the difference that we have right here. So let's take a look at the taxonomy of AI, because I think this is important. So in bigger circle, we have computer science. You're familiar with that. I'm from the School of Information Studies. We're very IT focused. I would put them in the, the same camp. I think Madison is, uh, has a brand new data information studies uh, school that's coming along, which is exciting for Wisconsin. Inside that bubble, we're going to have artificial intelligence. Inside that bubble there, we're going to have deep learning, and then, or machine learning, and then deep learning. And then overlapping that is data science. And if you're using some AI, if you're training the models with information, you're in that overlap. Otherwise, you can just be doing regression analysis, right? We've had statistics for a long time. So uh, data science may be included, may not be included, depending on what type of research or application that you're taking a look at. All right, so how about a definition of machine learning? It's an application of artificial intelligence that provides systems the ability to automatically learn and improve experiences without being explicitly programmed. Okay, that's the differentiation that we're having right here. All right, over on the right-hand side, I won't go through this chart. There's supervised learning, there's unsupervised learning, and then there is uh, reinforced learning. And it can go anything from content recommendation systems to uh, classifications to the uh, AI-powered engine behind an autonomous vehicle. So those are the areas in there. 
Um, I love this slide because uh, Scott Page from the University of Michigan says that companies are increasingly trying to harness the rolling hairball of data that they collect on a daily basis, all right? Let's think about, sometimes you probably heard AI and big data used together, right? Okay, just because you have a lot of data doesn't mean that you have effective data. And what I mean by that is that the root of machine learning and artificial intelligence is trying to extract knowledge from our data. That is the key piece. Think about on a daily basis all the purchases that you make, all the information that's being collected from you, and companies are trying to harvest that um, so that they can provide you with better and product services um, through their uh, organizations. All right, so this is one thing I, I want to parlay off of the, the concept that I said that our jobs will be disrupted. So think about what humans really, really do well. Okay, humans are good at creativity, they're uh, good at improvisation, they're good at dexterity, they're good at judgment and social leadership. What are machines good at? Machines are good at accuracy, predictive capability, speed, scalability. We want to combine those two together to have an effective solution. And I think that's where really the power of AI comes in. And that will result in some disruptions, but it'll also uh, give us the ability to have humans work in higher economic value, okay? That's really the key piece in that. All right, a couple applications here. Um, you're probably familiar with self-driving vehicles. A lot of techniques is going to be planning from going from A to B. It's going to be computer vision. It's going to be real-time decision-making and uncertainty. We have a whole slew of autonomous uh, um, vehicles that are going across everywhere from ships to cars to robots inside of factories. So this is obviously one area. How about content recommendation systems? Um, you probably don't know this, but on a daily basis when you go into your social media feed, or if you even go to Google, that is tailored towards you. They're looking at your past patterns. They're looking at patterns of people similar to you. In fact, I just did an exercise for my students today about a content recommendation systems about products. Um, and then they're offering something up. That's why it's so effective when you go into Netflix and you can find a show that you really like. Or that's why it's so effective when you go into Amazon and you can see a product or a book or something that you really like. Um, so all of that is AI basically behind the scenes. Uh, how about computer vision? So uh, facial recognition is used in a lot of different companies. I'm a part of Global Entry. It allows me to bypass customs, which I really like. Um, but it's used in a variety of different ways. If you've ever had a friend that has uploaded a picture of you onto uh, social media like Facebook or um, Instagram or something like that, and then it sends you a message, hey, this is you. Their algorithm on Facebook is so good that they can identify you with almost 97% effectiveness. Now, whether you like that or not, and whether you like the privacy piece is another conversation, but this is real, okay? Um, and then additionally, uh, this is actually a couple years old, the DSH is going to have facial recognition at 97% of departing airports in, in the next four years. In fact, this article is actually even a, um, a couple years old here. So whether you like that or not, this is the reality of the uh, environment that we live in today. All right, so last slide. What is UWM doing in this space? Uh, we face, uh, obviously because of COVID, um, a lot of challenges, but we have a lot of really great pieces at uh, UWM. Let's start with the Connected Systems Institute. That is a collaboration between Rockwell, which is a traditional manufacturer, and Microsoft. And again, they're trying to harvest advanced manufacturing data in order to be able to use AI um, to be more effective in the, in the manu manufacturing process. Um, the Data Science Institute, which is uh, from Northwestern Mutual Life, is a collaboration between Marquette University, Northwestern Mutual, which is a large employer across the country and in the state of Wisconsin, and Marquette University, and we have a lot of researchers uh, um, doing uh, research around there. A couple of years back, I created the Disruptive Technologies Lab, which I, think I referenced, which is trying to address, again, all these emerging technologies. We're creating new courses, we're doing webinars in there, we're collaborating with our strategic partners. So we're doing all of this in order to be able to bring the workforce of the future forward. That is really the goal. Um, the last one uh, that I'll mention is we have a, a $10 million, two-year-old building, the Lubar Center of Entrepreneurship. And this is a really cool, I have a class there where I teach um, how, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs how to create businesses, not only in AI, but also in blockchain. And it's a really cool place. It doesn't belong to any particular building. It doesn't belong to business. It doesn't belong to engineering. It doesn't belong to information studies. It is a standalone building where we have these accidental collisions, um, where we have architecture students, where we have business students, where we have engineering students, all come together 
to learn not only the lean launch process, which is the standard for, uh, my opinion, for uh, creating businesses right now, but to collaborate on these different projects. And one of the questions that I'm going to ask the panelists, and one of my opinion, is that the way that you have the most effective AI solutions today right now is to have a diverse team, is to have a diverse team. So this is a really cool place. They run a lot of programming for students, and they help them become the professionals that they're going to uh, be going forward. Okay, thank you so much for your time. I will invite Tony up here to speak then. Oh, um, if you're interested, you can go take a look at an application of artificial intelligence right there. It'll, uh, it's a facial recognition to see if you're sad or angry or something like that. Now I'll, now I'll invite Tony up here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. I'm excited to take some of the introductory material that Matt presented, what is AI, what is machine learning, and take a little bit more of a deeper dive and talk about how my research group and many of our collaborators at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and elsewhere are using some of these ideas Matt talked about toward drug discovery. So when I think about drug discovery, uh, I'm really thinking today about small molecules and chemicals and how they can be used to treat disease. So looking at some examples here of some big blockbusters, warfarin, a local product from Madison, has been very effective as a blood thinner. And we see warfarin has this chemical structure. There's some rings, we have atoms, carbons, oxygens, hydrogens. And what's special about this particular configuration of simple atoms that makes it so effective as a blood thinner? Uh, another example on the right, and this one's been in the news recently, we have an anti antiviral compound, molnupiravir, has shown some really promising, very early clinical trial results from Merck as a uh, coronavirus, COVID-19 antiviral. Here we see its chemical structure. Uh, what's so special about this antiviral that makes it effective against different viruses? And more importantly, as we go forward, and as my group and our partners are trying to develop new small molecules, new chemicals that will be effective against new diseases, new disease targets, what are these magical, special chemical structures and configurations that are going to be effective against new viral proteins, new bacterial proteins, or other human diseases? So in the academic research setting, and some of you from pharma industry may be picturing something different, but in the academic setting, when we're working on drug discovery, trying to find these chemicals that will be effective against a new disease of interest, a new disease target, our process looks something like this. And I'm going to try to walk through the drug discovery process and contrast it with a culinary process, uh, maybe because it's almost lunchtime and it's familiar to all of us. So we typically start off with the same freezer of, of chemicals. We have a library of chemicals, maybe there's 100,000 of these. We're going to pluck them out and use these robotic systems. We have these at uh, the Cancer Center at UW-Madison, and we'll just start working our way through hundreds and thousands of chemicals looking for anything that seems to have some promise, seems to maybe have some hint of being effective against the new protein, the new disease target that we're interested in developing uh, a new drug against. So I liken this to a, a pretty one-size-fits-all process. No matter what the disease, we're always going to the same freezer, we're always starting with the same chemicals. So in the culinary world, I think this is uh, the cafeteria approach to, to serving diners. So everybody who walks in doesn't get a menu. This is what's being served. You're welcome to eat it or not. You, know, you will be provided lunch. Maybe it will be a recipe you like. Maybe it will be a cuisine you like. Maybe not. And I, I think there's actually a real analogy here in that even when we find chemicals that seem promising through this brute force process of plucking them from the freezer, they may not be very effective, they may not be very specific. So even the things that look like winners uh, are pretty weak to start with. So how can we do better? This is where machine learning has really started to, to have some impact, and we've had some practical successes already using machine learning to guide this drug discovery process in a more intentional and active way. So we can think about uh, something that's happening in the chemical and pharma industry world, that there's been an explosion of the number of new chemicals we can actually develop and synthesize. And we might call these chemical recipes that are now commercially available. And a recipe might look like what we're seeing here, uh, a series of chemical reactions that let us go from simpler building blocks to a chemical we might all like, such as caffeine shown here, or maybe a drug-like molecule that would be effective against our disease. So the challenge in drug discovery is if I have a billion or two billion different chemical recipes that are now available to me, 
how can I choose what handful of chemicals to actually create, synthesize, and test in a lab to see if they might be effective against a specific disease? So this is really exciting because now we have all these recipes. We have every recipe book you could imagine, and we have this master chef who can cook any recipe to perfection and deliver it to us. But the question is, well, what should we cook? How do we guide the chef? And this is where machine learning comes in. So Matt talked about how machine learning is going to learn from data, learn from examples. So our chef, the machine learning system, might be looking at feedback about what recipes they've cooked, what ingredients are there, what types of cuisines, and my personalized feedback about, I like these ingredients, I like these cuisine styles, I love Ethiopian food, and use that to tailor recommendations about what to cook next. We're doing that same thing, but with the chemical drug discovery process and trying to decide which chemical recipes we should be looking at instead of which food recipes. So looking ahead, where might this go next? So I mentioned these small molecules, they're really just built up of some pretty simple building blocks, oxygens, sulfurs, hydrogens, some, some common substructures. Machine learning at some point in the future may be able to not just choose from the list of recipes, but actually write the recipes on its own. And I think that's really exciting when we think about having some disease and creating completely from scratch with guidance from artificial intelligence, some custom fit chemical that's likely to be effective. And that will be like coming up with a brand new recipe. No one's ever seen it before. There's a massive chemical space. There's a, a massive number of recipes you might create. And the challenge is going to be uh, doing that in a way so that we can actually create those recipes. We don't come up with something that's chemically impossible to manufacture or create. But I think there's going to be progress here in, in the not so distant future. So turning from this abstract introduction of how machine learning and learning from chemical testing of these recipes uh, it can help us guide drug discovery, I'd like to zoom into some active collaborations we're working with. So uh, one great thing about being in the University of Wisconsin system is that both UW-Milwaukee, UW-Madison have a lot of data science strengths. We also have a lot of biology strengths, so structural biology and chemistry and biochemistry, and a lot of great scientists who are uh, studying different diseases and coming up with bacterial proteins, different disease targets, so things that we would like to uh, chemically inhibit or alter their activity because it might actually counteract some disease. So uh, I'll give one example here. We're working with James Keck's lab at UW-Madison. They're studying this particular bacterial species, and there's a lot of interest and need to develop novel types of antibiotics because uh, there's increasing bacterial resistance to some of the classes of antibiotics that we have on the market and available right now in, in clinical settings. So looking at this bacterial strain of pneumonia, and trying to ask how can we develop new types of chemicals that will kill bacteria. And without going too deep into the biology, they've done a lot of background research and found out there's two special bacterial proteins. They stick together like this, make these 3D shapes. And what's important is that if you're able to unstick them, if you can break apart these two proteins, it kills the bacteria. So here's something to go after. Now we just need to figure out what are the special chemicals that have the right shapes the right configurations of atoms that are going to be able to squeeze in between these two proteins, break them apart, and kill bacteria. So this is where we jumped in. Uh, and the Keck lab kind of started with the traditional process that I described. So they worked with the small molecule screening facility at UW-Madison and started this very laborious process. Uh, took a lot of grad students and scientists and technician labor to pull the chemicals from the freezer and just work their way through over days and weeks and months, testing over 400,000 chemicals to try to see if any of them could break apart these bacterial proteins, which would kill the bacteria. They do this for a long, long, long time, and their reward is finding that 99.9% .9 of what they tested completely failed. There's a tiny, tiny sliver of chemicals that might be promising. Most of those are also not very good. But what this generates is a lot of data. So now we have an area that's really ripe for machine learning to step in. So my group worked with the Keck Lab and others on campus, and we trained machine learning models on all this data, trying to figure out what makes the sliver of chemicals different from everything else that definitely failed. And we took that trained machine learning model and let it score a billion more recipes that were commercially available and came up with a small list of just 68 chemicals that looked very appealing per the machine learning criteria. This was actually an example of what Matt called of a AI human partnership because we were working with chemists, we were working with the Keck lab to try to figure out what's appealing to the machine learning system but also to the chemists so that we aren't just uh, being completely blind when we follow the machine learning system's recommendations. 
we ended up purchasing a small number, bringing them to campus and testing them. And almost half of what we tested was a pretty strong hit. So we go from 99.9% .9 complete failures to an almost 50% hit rate, where because the machine learning system is guiding our decisions about what to test, we can have a much more customized view of which chemicals might actually work against these bacterial proteins. And we've been going forward to try to develop this and uh, actually have some new scientific results coming out, hopefully this week or next, about this project. So just to wrap up, I, I think that there's some really strong evidence from my research group and many others internationally showing that machine learning systems are actually strong enough today to have some ability to guide the chemical screening process for drug discovery. You know, the bad news and what I like to think about in terms of what research is needed in the future, I don't think they've had the same impact today on the later stages of drug discovery. So machine learning isn't yet reducing our animal testing needs. It's not yet reducing the number of failed clinical trials that we have. And those are going to be some grand challenges that we might think about going forward. So thank you, and I hope to have time to take some questions on this later. Next, we'll hear from Aya Khalil, who is joining us remotely. Wonderful. Can you hear me? All right, great. Um, really glad to uh, be here and to uh, speak to this audience. Apologies for the, the writing at the bottom of the PowerPoint. So, uh, you know, we can do all, all these great things with AI, but some things, just turning off a feature ends up being really, really hard. Um, so just a few things. So I'm here to talk about the work that Novartis is doing and really helping us leverage the power of data and AI to reimagine how we develop medicines. Um, and I'm really glad to, um, to announce that we're doing a lot of this in partnership with Wisconsin, where we have 228 trials running uh, in Wisconsin itself. In the last five years, we've run 60 trials across multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, uh, blood, prostate, lung, and breast cancer. Um, and we're working with the University of Wisconsin, the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, and the Medical College of Wisconsin. And um, this is a great example of sort of what's needed to actually bring medicines to patients is this collaboration that needs to happen and is happening between industry um, and the great clinical centers that are happening in the state of Wisconsin. All right, so just to get started, I wanna put a little bit of perspective in terms of how far we've come with AI and these uh, deep learning and machine learning algorithms. So in 2016, uh, it was announced um, that uh, this algorithm, this AI algorithm called AlphaGo, beat the world champion at Go itself. So this is a machine now that's able to beat a human at playing this simple game. And you might ask, well, what does this have to do with biology and discovering new medicines? Well, it turns out that these AI algorithms with similar deep learning architectures, sort of similar machine learning algorithms underlying them, helped us solve a big grand challenge in biology. Um, how do we predict from uh, what we call the, the sequence of the protein what its actual structure, three-dimensional structure is going to look like. Um, and proteins, they're the workhorses that essentially do everything in our body. Um, they're important for how our brain functions, important for our metabolism. And when we talk about discovering drugs, and as what was shown earlier, our goal is to find uh, chemicals, molecules that can interact with that protein and change what it'll actually do. Uh, and if it does that, then we have a shot maybe at uh, modulating the disease um, and, uh, and getting to potential cures. So really understanding what that protein structure looks like is super important to the drug discovery and development process. And it's just mind boggling that you can take these AI algorithms and apply them in a completely different area, the area of biology, and use it to potentially predict the 3D structure of a protein. So what makes this work? I think there's sort of two kind of big features of this. Um, the first is that you know, uh, the architecture underlying a lot of this AI, a lot of this machine learning are these neural networks. And it's, it literally draws its analogy from a neural net of how a brain works and allows you to take in data and massive amounts of data and essentially have it train on what would lead to your ability to predict a specific output or outcome. And in between that, it will leverage as many nodes as it needs to, as many interactions and connectivity as it needs to, to get to that prediction. And one of the big breakthroughs with using these deep learning neural net algorithms is that they could actually, if you give them more data, their performance can improve and they can improve vastly above traditional machine learning algorithms or traditional 
um, st statistical algorithms and other kinds of learning algorithms. And this is essentially the opportunity is that this concept, this idea that if we can gather enough data on the systems that we're trying to learn how they work, we can actually improve our performance drastically and maybe be able to predict things that we couldn't be able to predict before, such as predicting the actual three-dimensional structure of a protein. Another example of now how this is actually impacting the field of medicine, aside from protein structure or uh, being able to find and identify a new chemical, um, is just how we even detect and diagnose disease. Again, another sort of breakthrough example where, um, you know, we, when you go into the ophthalmologists, they're usually using the power of their own neural net, of their own brain, to diagnose you. But what happens if we give this algorithm um, lots and lots of OT OCT images and, and try to train it and ask it, could it actually diagnose whether you have normal, moderate, severe? And can we get to accuracy levels that maybe exceed what an ophthalmologist uh, could get to? And starting in 2016, we started to see that this was actually possible. We could actually train these algorithms on lots of images, lots of scenarios, and start to get to more um, accurate assessment of disease, and even use it um, to train on other kinds of data besides these images, such as your blood pressure, your age, your gender, and could it even help guide potential treatment decisions? Now, this is a machine. We train it on what we need to, but we still have the power of the human brain. So a lot of what we're trying to do with these algorithms is not so much replace the physician, replace the scientist that's trying to find a new drug, but help augment um, their abilities and really get to a, a vision where we could use AI and machine learning along with human intelligence to help us get us to better treatments uh, and diagnoses of disease. And so in this vision of trying to reimagine medicine, really the goal is how can we use data and all kinds of data um, coming from your human genome, um, biometrics, lab values, um, chemical structure data, massive amounts of data and all types that speak to the nature of your health, of your disease and how you interact in this ecosystem of biology and chemistry. And for the first time in history, we're actually able to measure a lot of things we couldn't before in human health. And this is why you're seeing sort of a lot of this, what can AI do in medicine? And then combine this now with the advances in AI that I just discussed that allow us to create um, these types of machine learning, AI deep learning algorithms that can essentially learn off of massive amounts of data sets. And once we can learn these things, okay, what does that mean in terms of our ability to therapeutically intervene? And especially to therapeutically intervene in an era where not only can we go after your disease with small molecules, but other kinds of modalities. We're talking now about gene therapy and mRNA therapeutics, which has now become uh, really well known with the COVID vaccines. So this is our goal at Novartis, is really to leverage now best-in-class data and data sources with machine learning and AI algorithms and our ability to intervene to hopefully get to and reimagine how we do medicine. So what if we could reduce the time it gets to new therapeutic to market by two plus years and what that means for patients. Uh, could we read more patients faster through these technologies? Uh, could we reinvent how we actually do fundamental discovery of medicines? And as um, the previous feature that showed, you know, we, we talk about um, trying to use AI uh, to help us even design the molecules that we go after. So this is an example of work that Novartis is doing in partnership with Microsoft, uh, where we've built out these AI machine learning, deep learning algorithms that can take in sort of a, a hint of a potential molecule that could target your disease and start to, in silico, um, explore and design many other possibilities until it comes up with a molecule that is much more suited for hitting that target in terms of all the properties that you would like it to have we talk about things like solubility, permeability, but all of these things have an impact on how well the drug can work and how safe it's likely to be, how efficacious it's likely to be. And now we're using these AI algorithms to essentially help us discover and design these molecules. And again, using it as a tool, an add-on tool to augment the intelligence of a medicinal chemist who can use their intuition plus the machine intelligence to help us get to improve molecules faster and better. Um, so this is on the molecular front, um, and we want to go just beyond using AI and machine learning to help us discover and design these molecules to actually impacting patient health. And we're at a point now where for every human, we can actually go in and collect 
all kinds of measures that we couldn't before. Measures on, we hear about genomics a lot, but it's genomics coupled with many other things, uh, whether it's biosensor data, data on your immune system, on the health of your gut, your microbe, um, and being able to take now lots of patient data with these advances in AI and machine learning and using the algorithms as a way to predict what will happen to an individual. What's the best treatment suited for them? Uh, what's treatments that are not suited for them? And so that we can learn from this data and in silico start to predict these things. Um, as part of our effort to make this happen within Novartis, we've committed and have been committed to harmonizing a lot of our data. So we looked back and said, oh my God, we have 2 million patient years worth of clinical trial data on our patients. What would happen if we brought it all together and harmonize it and enable us to build um, learning algorithms on top of this that can help us predict outcomes for patients? And we're doing this and actively doing this now. And as part of our commitment to that, starting to explore, well, could I now start to build algorithms that will allow me in silico to test out the impact of a treatment? And what does that mean in terms of uh, being able to run better trials or being able to run trials that really can select the specific patients that are more likely to respond to that treatment? And could, how would that impact our ability to get that drug approved into market? And we're also learning new things, you know, things that you wouldn't kind of um, intuit in terms of what you need from the AI perspective to make progress. Um, and so a lot of the progress in deep learning has really in some way fundamentally been about how do we find these patterns and learn enough of the patterns so that we can predict something. But in medicine, we need to go beyond prediction and we aim to actually learn and want to understand cause and effect. And right now the human brain has probably been sort of our biggest way of trying to intuit or learn cause and effect, but we wanna teach machines how to do that. And that necessitates potentially developing new methods and new AI algorithms that uh, maybe don't quite exist. So to help us do that development, we've set up an AI innovation center directly within Novartis. Um, and we're partnering with other entities like Microsoft to help us build out these capabilities to not only build the kinds of algorithms that we know will impact and benefit our uh, drug discovery process and development process and how we treat patients today, but also develop new, new algorithms for tomorrow um, so that we can come up with breakthrough discoveries and even get to models and algorithms that can, again, empower the scientists that we already have, the clinicians that we already have, the, and augment their workflows to help them uh, get to these answers in a better, more efficient way. And lastly, um, there's a lot of sort of, uh, somebody used the word hype, hype out there on, um, you know, what does this mean in terms of uh, the ethics of AI and controversies around that? And we're taking that very seriously. Um, and we have set up a framework um, for us, and we can see this, it's, it's actually publicly available. You can go look on sort of the principles around what we think uh, will enable us to leverage these very powerful capabilities uh, in a very ethical and responsible way. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody. I'm gonna pull myself out and push myself back into the actual conference and hopefully be able to see everybody. Thank you. Am I back in? All right, my friends, we have about five minutes left. I've been asked that we keep this to about 11.50 because we're on the other side of lunch, which is very important. So to make this a really <laughs> robust, rich experience, I challenge you to go to either one of those mics and ask a really great question. I see two, two gentlemen either going to ask a question or going to lunch. Hopefully they'll ask a question. Go ahead, sir, please. Yeah, my question uh, is regarding using AI in gaming um, technologies and platforms. I've seen recently that uh, that's an application that's being used in order to learn um, using the gaming community. I'm wondering if any or, or each of you have had any experience with that. Anybody want to take that one? I'll, I'll take a swag at it. So um, anytime that you have large quantities of data and you can extract knowledge from that, and improve the gaming experience, I could certainly see applications of that as well. Um, none of us talked about uh, uh, adversarial networks, but they can be used to not only um, 
identify images, but generate images as well. And one of the interesting things, I think, on the gaming side is that you're going to see that these adversarial networks are going to be used to create the assets inside of the games. And think about how much money is spent to generate the characters and the backgrounds and things like that. So anytime there's information, anytime it can be uh, you know, extracted from or anytime it can be used in order to uh, add assets to something, I think AI can improve that experience. That Um, I, I guess that would be my takeaway. I don't know if any of the other uh, panelists have an, an opinion on that one. It sounds like you're more on the, on the medical side. Uh, why don't you go ahead, sir? So um, I heard a lot of discussion about drug discovery and AI and drug discovery, but uh, you also mentioned that we have to be able to make it. So um, what advances are we using uh, AI for in the manufacturing process? And then what are the best tools available to do that? Yeah, really good question. So uh, one of the things that uh, we're, sorry for the echo, we're aiming to leverage AI with um, is around formulary design. So once as you've mentioned, you've discovered the drug, you actually have to go in, into manufacturing um, and can you use um, AI to help you essentially uh, create a better formulary um, in the same way that if you were making any other product and a lot of the uh, so products that make it out onto the shelf, like your milk or whatnot, you can even develop algorithms that can help predict the shelf life of these things. We're aiming to apply the same thing in the formulary design process. Um, and then on the manufacturing side, um, you know, thinking of this as a system, and an entire system where there are sets of nodes that need to interact with each other, building models or algorithms that can mimic or model that and help us identify where we could have better efficiencies. Very good, how about you, sir? I th thank you very much for the talk. My name is Tom Foti, I work at Aldevron, and uh, my question is for Aya. Um, it's in regards to drug discovery around CRISPR and applying AI to, to CRISPR for specific targets. Is, is Novartis working on projects like that? Um, so the answer is on a high level, yes. And we, we work with that technology and we have um, in our research organization over 200 data scientists who are applying all kinds of data science, machine learning, and AI approaches to that. Um, so anyways, th thanks for the answer. I'd like to follow up with you also on that, if we could, in the, um, after the Absolutely. conference. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, hello. Thank you all. I'm Acharya, Chief Research Officer from Advocate Aurora Health. Uh, great topic here today. Uh, my question relates to probably the hype part of the machine learning that you all have uh, alluded to. Obviously, it yeah. signs kind of replicability and reproducibility reproducing the results is very important. But machine learning in of itself, the approach within, uh, you know, is sometimes called as black box. So what are each one of you doing in your respective organization or within your research groups to kind of addressing that so that there's a little bit more openness to the whole uh, approach of machine learning and AI? Thank you. Yeah, maybe if I could start, and I'd, I'd love to hear the other panelists' opinion on that. One of the interesting things, I think the skill sets that are gonna be required in this space is to be able to be a storyteller. And I agree that uh, AI can be a, a black box because sometimes you can feed it some information and the resulting uh, output might not be intuitive. And as a consequence, you have to go to either your university or you have to go to your organization and communicate, look, this is what uh, the results are out of this and this is probably the strategic approach that we should take to that. So. Even though we're having you know, a transition in a lot of the jobs that we have, it's going to require a diverse skill set of teams in order to bring this forward. So a lot of conversations we have are around people with humanities degrees and how they can play a role in a very successful diverse team in being able to bring these projects forward. Uh, I would never advocate that a project is just a, a, a data science or a data engineer or an AI engineer. It's gonna require a lot of different profiles in order to be able to do that. So I think in order to um, overcome that black box nature, you have to have a diverse team in order to be able to address that. Um, I don't know if any of the other panelists want to chime in on that. Yeah, so I, I think from a technical side, there's been a lot of research in opening the black box. And if we look at the, the deep neural networks that I have presented, how can you actually understand what's going on inside them? So there are approaches now that say, if you predict that this chemical is going to be an effective antibiotic, 
what parts of the chemical structure are important for making that prediction. So you can try to interpret the predictions. Uh, but then I completely agree with what Matt's saying, is that to actually use those technical tools and see if these predictions and the interpretations make sense, you really do need a diverse team. So I can't just sit and look at those interpretations myself and be successful. We have to work with a lot of other collaborators, partners who have uh, different experiences to, to be most successful there. Yeah. I, and I would add to that. So I, I think it's it's those three things. The first being there are now um, methodologies that people are working on for around explainability of AI and getting to explainability. And that's a big and flourishing field. And we need more of that for sure. Um, the second is that the multidisciplinary nature of the team, I described a lot of uh, the way that we want to use AI as a, a way to you know, augment the human. So we're talking augmenting the scientists and their decision making, augmenting the clinician and how they think about designing their trials or who to test their drugs on. Um, and that speaks to what you said about multidisciplinary. And I think the third is none of this is independent of data. So not only the data that we train the models on, but also testing, going back into the wet lab um, and testing these things, or if we're talking about uh, within the context of um, understanding our treatments within humans, uh, checking against multiple data sets. And, um, and the, now that we're aggregating a lot of data sets in, in many ways from human trials and real world sources, it becomes really, really important. And it's a feedback loop. So, you know, some of the times you are going to be wrong and you're going to find places where your models aren't quite working and you need to go back and, and rethink these models. They need to evolve. Um, it's, a, it's a way to learn, essentially. We have to think of this as a, as a learning engine and as a learning engine that we want to embed in our workflows to help us make better decisions and not necessarily completely replace that. Uh, one more question, and then I think we'll conclude our session. So go ahead, sir. All right. Um, I'm a nutritional chemist. Um, we get all sorts of different, uh, like, artificial sweeteners and things like that, different types of products that uh, come to the market. And um, detectability and instrumentation is kind of a big uh, limit for uh, using some of those new compounds. Um, I was wondering if you guys take that into account when uh, developing new drugs and stuff like that with machine learning. Can you uh, apply like whether or not it'll be detectable or testable in like the QC uh, part of the phase? Anybody want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, it's a, a good question. I, I I think you're saying it's not something any of us have direct experience with. Um, I, I guess you know, there are a lot of different chemical and molecular properties that uh, as long as there are sufficient data sets, there's perhaps hope of building up some model that can understand why this chemical structure has this property. Uh, certainly people have looked at that for taste and scent and other things that are not just specifically drug efficacy. I haven't heard of anyone doing it for some of those QC steps, but it wouldn't surprise me if someone has tried and I'm just not aware of that line of work. Yeah, and thinking about it, it's probably uh, more likely that the innovation of the new drugs and stuff is probably pushing more of the innovation for new types of instrumentation. Um. <laughs> All right, well, I think it's uh, lunchtime here. I'm going to try and keep us on task. So I appreciate it. Um, thank you, uh, Aya. Thank you, uh, Tony. Thank you uh, for the crowd for coming today. We really appreciate your time today. So thank you very much.